I'm Randy Moggins, and this is Off Planet Radio Live for January 30th, 2013. Great show lined up tonight. First hour, Crystal Clark is here with me. And then in the second hour, we're going to be joined by James C. Horak. And uh, I guarantee you one thing tonight, you will have food for thought because the signal-to-noise ratio is about to be trimmed incredibly. We have, as a media, pussyfooted around a lot of issues for a lot of years, and it's time to get real about who we are, where we're going, and what we're doing. And uh, I can't think of two better people to do that with than with James and Crystal. And uh, that brings me to another thing. There are a lot of attacks right now, cyber attacks going on. And these are targeted attacks. And uh, actually, it's Crystal that's kind of helped me realize this. But the botting and spamming and all the other things that are going on out there in cyberspace are really designer attacks on people who are activists. Um, right now, I'm having problems with my domains, and I'm working on that. I've actually got somebody that's helping me out with that. But these are directed attacks, worm attacks, bots, hijacking of domain name servers, hijacking of email addresses. These are all aspects of the war that continues in the area of alternative media. And so I imagine that it will not get easier at all. I also want you to kind of keep an eye. I posted a story over on the uh, main website at offplanetradio.com. Jimmy Seville, The Road to Royal Ruin. We're watching the story break out there. This is probably the largest global pedophilia scandal that's been broken open and uh, a lot of us are hoping that the world's finally ready to hear the story about what pedophilia really is because it goes beyond the sexual predator and the uh, networking of children. It goes into murder. It goes into satanic ritual. It goes into how business is done globally. And it's time we talk about this. I have some sources right now that are telling me the story in Great Britain could be quite huge, and I have somebody... I hope to do an interview with very soon. So that's what's going on. That's what's happening in our world. Welcome to it this evening. And with that, I want to bring up my guest. She's been on before with me, and I think tonight's interview is going to sort of cement the relationship that she has with our audience. And we welcome Crystal Clark. Crystal, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Thank you very much, Randy. It's good to be back. It's good to have you on. Um, I think the last time we talked, we kind of did a loose kind of, uh, well, I don't remember exactly what we talked about now. <laughs> it was kind of loose. But tonight, we're going to be a little bit more focused. You put an article out, and I have said in no uncertain terms that I believe your article on uh, cosmological ignorance is probably one of the most important articles on the Internet right now. In your first book, you wrote, there are three primary elements of denial taking place in the world of man today that should be seen as entirely contradictory to the survival of our race. The first is truths our governments have denied us. The second, truths our churches have denied us. And the third, truths that we deny ourselves. Yes, that's very, very true. I know that at this point, I probably sound like a broken record when I say that proper knowledge of what it takes, creational design systems, which I refer to as the sacred science, what it takes those systems to give us life, we are being denied that knowledge because it's being weaponized and abused against us. And furthermore, that if we don't have that knowledge, that's when we become easily manipulated, and that's why we don't have it. And we are seeing the truth of this, I think, more and more and more. And obviously our governments aren't going to help us because their own handlers are behind them and then they in turn handle us. So we're not going to get the truth from them. Religion obviously isn't interested in giving us the truth either because they are also part of the structure of control. But at the same time, the truths that we deny ourselves, which go back to those two truths... I think can be far more damaging. You know, more and more I hear people say, well, why would you look at something so awful? We need to be solution-based. Don't look at something that's negative, quote, negative. But 
I don't really know what solutions these people think they're going to come up with if they can't actually look at the problems. And we all want a future that's peaceful, on top of the fact that we actually want a future. But what people have yet to really face themselves is that peace is not possible without truth. And it doesn't matter how ugly it is in the beginning, without it, peace is not possible. Because when there is no truth, we are not just at war within ourselves, we are at war with each other. Because we are not coming from the same knowledge base. And that's purposeful. But I also would, before we really get into that, Randy, I would like to go back to what you were saying when you opened the show about the targeted attacks. Yeah. This thing called a disposition matrix that the Obama administration has used to relabel their hit-kill list, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that people really understand what this is. We are talking about personality profiling. That's what this is, and I wrote about this in the first book a great deal as well in terms of data mining. What they are actually doing is looking for the dissenters and the heretics from the official narrative by using behavioral modeling that comes to them in the form of our records, our behavioral records. This began with debit card purchases. So instantly all of that could be filtered because it's already electronic data. You don't need a data entry clerk to put it in. So that immediately populates their database. What did we buy? Where did we buy it? Who are we buying it from? And then we have... What books are we reading? What did we buy on Amazon? What is the pattern of what we're reading? And then there's what we're writing on Facebook. What is the pattern of what we're writing? What are our thoughts? And I think the best example I have seen in terms of how important this is was in a series that should still be available on Netflix called Caprica, which was supposed to be the prequel to right. Battlestar Battle Star Galactica. Galactica. Yeah. yeah. And in this series... One of the main characters was a technological genius, although he had a teenage daughter who had surpassed him already. And if I remember right, her name was Chloe. And she and others like her had created a virtual reality wherein they were uploading their personal disposition matrix into their avatars, basically copying the personality of themselves into their avatar. And at one point, when he was looking into his daughter's work after she had kind of left the picture, he was trying to do this with his wife, with an avatar that he could literally interact with, and that's exactly what he was using. He was mining all of the uh, footprint, the data footprint, of her thoughts and behaviors and actions as they could be found through mining the data of her online activity. And when he would plug the data in to create this personality, then he would interact with the avatar, and if it didn't respond the way he felt was a true reflection of his wife, then he would tweak it again. He would go back and kind of get more data. And it was from here in the story that this information became uploaded into a virtual world and then from there was uploaded into a machine called a Cylon. And from there, that's where the, quote, artificial intelligence kind of thing happened. But what I really want people to recognize is what this is really for. And there is a very telling article that RT just put out about the boss of Google revealing to people his view of technology, especially in terms of the Internet in the future. Is this Sergey Brin? No. Um, oh, this is the new CTO, the CTO of Google. Schmidt. Oh, his name Schmidt. Is Schmidt. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay, got it. So he's talking about virtual kidnappings. He's talking about because your virtual profile is a virtual you, yeah. that it can be held hostage for ransom. He's talking about that. And he's talking about drone strikes on hackers in the future. And <laughs> yeah, this right. particular, yeah, <laughs> well, I want to talk about the implications of that in just a moment. But I thought this particular quote is very important. He said, people from a group the government doesn't like will have their payments stopped, their access to the Internet cut off, and their tweets deleted. And this goes back to, now this is also in conjunction with Bill Gates and this initiative that he has that is called Better Than Cash Alliance. I don't know if you've heard about this. And it is based on the completely erroneous idea that the elimination of cash transactions will benefit the poor. 
This is not the case. And one thing that I found with Windows 8 and why it was so difficult for me to work with when I first got it is that I was interacting with this software program based on my previous interactions with Windows. And what was hanging me up and causing me a lot of problems in the beginning is that I didn't understand that Windows does not want you to have multiple profiles or email addresses and personalities. They want everything merged into one personality. This directly feeds into what this fellow from Google was saying because he's talking about IDs, the importance of having an ID that will track you everywhere you go and that you will have to log on with. But what this is really about is, which was very clearly expressed, I think, in that quote I just read from his statement, is that they are looking to find a way to cut people off from accessing it if people are not going to behave the way they want them to behave. So people really kind of have to get their head around that. And you see, it's always the same pattern because when I was having problems, I went to the Windows 8 help desk and everybody was having the same problem and the help desk employees were almost like little information Nazis and they just kept repeating the same phrase over and over. Well, we need to make sure it's really you to protect your privacy and your security. This has nothing to do with our privacy and our security. It is about creating an, an internet environment where people who are not going to uphold the official narrative are going to be removed from accessing it. So this is the thought police again. And if we let this happen, it will become a useless tool. And the reason that all of this is being done is to ensure that it will become a useless tool because we have grown so much from using it. I know that over the years I've used numerous emails, and I don't use the same email for everything. And even in dealing with merchants and things like that, I try to keep a certain level of separation, but I did notice with Windows 8 that they were asking for a login based on an email address. And I thought that was curious and interesting, and you just tied some of that together. So effectively, the technology is the means by which they're going to presumably economically control us, Crystal. And I, I kind of snickered when you said about, you know, these attacks. We're being attacked right now. I have uh, domain name servers that I now have evidence have been altered. I didn't alter them. And they are pointing towards spam bots. So if I didn't alter my domain name server records, then somebody did, and they did it using a presumed identity. So right out of the chutes, their system seems to either be flawed or working perfectly. I still am not sure which it is. Well, again, if we understand that it's the same pattern over and over and over again, and what it basically amounts to is there's one rule for them and one rule for us. Yes. Yeah. That is built-in dichotomy, which creates the master and slave construct. So even in what I just said, so they're saying that we need to get to a point where we have IDs that will follow us everywhere we go and that we will not be able to access the Internet without proving that we are who we say they are and that people from a group the government doesn't like will be cut off and have their payments stopped. That's not going to work unless people like Bill Gates can get their better than cash alliance moving towards a cashless society because right now they can't control us to the degree that they want to. That's first and foremost. But at the same time, we know that right now they have publicly admitted that they have a cybersecurity task force creating false personas on the Internet to attack people, to manipulate public perception, and they even admitted that they are going to go in back doors into people's blogs and alter some of the wording to discredit those people, among other things. So how can you seriously believe that the ID system is going to apply to everyone when we already have people abusing the multiple identity without confirmation of who you are system? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. A lot of people have different IDs. I have a personal email that I use for family. I have one that I use for my writing work, and I have one that I use for my business. And those people that I communicate with through each of those things are not privy to what goes on in the other things because it doesn't apply to them, and I would like to keep it that way. What happens in one is no business of the others. Right, compartmentalization. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not hiding anything. I'm not a terrorist. But 
at some point, and, and I actually have written somewhat about this in the second book, we already have heard people say the DHS has already been steering people in this direction. People who use cash to pay for coffee are terrorists. You see, they're already seeding this into the collective to get people away from cash. But they're doing that because once everything is electronic, then you can be controlled. They can't control me if I have cash in my wallet, even if they close my bank account. But if I don't have any cash and it's all electronic and they cut off my access, then how do I feed my family? See, our currency and what we're doing right now is very much electronic. We're dealing with putting out information. And our only platform for this is the Internet. The Internet has been a great gift to people like you and I. But at the same time, we, I wasn't smart enough to, from day one, assume another name. This is my name. This is my identity. And I am who I say I am. I sometimes envy the people that were smart enough to do that. But it's already been dumped out there. There's a whole trail of evidence to be convicted upon, which I'm not ashamed of. But it's like now... It looks like the weapons could be turned against this. And yet at the same time, Crystal, look at the activism on the Internet. Look what happened with Sandy Hook when bloggers and YouTubers and people like me began to examine this and began to do some pretty damning um, deconstruction of the Sandy Hook narrative. And I was actually privy to a conversation that a listener of mine and a friend of mine had with the FBI up in Newtown, Connecticut. And the FBI was questioning this person, and they were very interested to know about social networkers and bloggers and what they were saying about Sandy Hook. Like, I guess that was their street-level investigative reporting that they were doing. The bottom line is, this is our platform, and I look at it now as it's probably got a limited lifespan, and we probably need to just dump it out there as fast as we can while we can still do it. Yes, I think that you are absolutely right. And in fact, the threat that was not idle, it was very clear by the one police officer who said, anybody who challenges this official narrative, we will go after. But at the same time, very quickly, I do want to point out that a lot of people don't think anything happened during those three days in 2012. But it did happen, and the truth of the matter is is that it doesn't really even matter that the change happened, only that it happened. Okay, you're talking it, about the 2012, the shift, the consciousness thing. Yes. Right? Yeah. There was a shift. There absolutely was a shift because I also engage in data mining, and I've tried to teach other people how to do it because it's from here that you get where this goes if you can understand what it is. You can make projections. You can have a clear understanding of what the continuation of one pattern or another will actually lead to in the end. And on the second day, on the 22nd, I woke up and there was a form of peace in the air. It was so silent, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a creepy kind of silent. It was really very peaceful and serene. And from that moment on, I recognized through watching the patterns in the social media that I see through my Facebook page and the people that I was talking to, I refer to it before as contemplation without resistance. And this is so important because this has not happened before. Before it had to be, you had to go through something rather traumatic and get that slap in the face to be snapped out of it. But that's not the case anymore. For a long time, we couldn't even talk to people about this stuff because they would not contemplate it because there was resistance. That is gone to a large degree, and you don't have to agree with something to contemplate it, and people understand that. And the real confirmation for me was when Sandy Hook happened, how fast people instantly knew that it was not right, that there was something wrong with it, and they immediately started tearing it apart. And that was a sign for me. At that point, I knew that this article, because this cosmology article that I've written, I had been working on for a long time. But until I saw the change in behavior and the willingness of people to look at things, I didn't finish it and put it out. So in a sense, what happened at Sandy Hook really did a big favor to a lot of people, like myself, who realized that the way people responded to that is their way of saying, we are ready to know the truth and we want it no matter what. And we know it when we don't see it. And that's why I finally released that article. If that shift and change had not happened, I probably still wouldn't have done it. 
because there's no point. If, if people aren't at a place where they're ready to really look at it, there's no point in putting it out. So you sense this change both in yourself, but you also were measuring and weighing things from a, an observational standpoint data-wise. In other words, what you perceived as a willingness to accept, I guess we'll call it new information for some people. See, Crystal, I know a little bit about your journey. I've shared some of mine over the years. This has been, for me, pretty much a lifetime waking up. And some of it's been traumatic, some of it's been gradual, and some of it has, um, well, there's been times when I've just frankly wanted to go sit in a corner and, and suck my thumb with what I learned. But a lot of people out there now seem to be on the fast track. They seem to be, it's almost like there was an acceleration in energetics. There was an increase in consciousness that's now being reflected. And I think this was part of the desperation move that was Sandy Hook and part of what you see now and what I'll just call a wholesale gun grab because the media is now saturated by it. I don't listen to or watch radio and TV a great deal, but I do observe. And in the last three days, I've been stunned by the level of theatrics that are out there, especially in terms of the Second Amendment rights and the guns in America, the polarization, I'll call it that, because they're always going to play off the dialectic. Do you agree with that? Absolutely, yes. Pitting us against each other is how they've gotten as far as they have. That's a big part of it. But the point I really wanted to make with what changed with Sandy Hook is that what I saw told me that people completely understand how far their government will go to lie to them and cover up their own misdeeds. They got it. And that has been such a difficult thing to express. But the way people responded, they get it. They are ready to understand how far their government will go. And they've went really, really far. Do we begin to see the disconnect? The people begin to evaporate? Is this a tidal change? Is it glacial? Are we really in rapid acceleration right now? Yes, absolutely. For me, that's the change that I saw that is so critical to the awakening process because if you try to tell somebody and they just put their hand up and say, I, I don't want to know, then it doesn't go very far. The hand isn't up anymore and people are genuinely looking at everything and trying to figure out what's going on, which is such a huge, huge change. Whether they know that they've changed or not doesn't matter because the change has happened. And that's what I mean about Sandy Hook. People are not resistant to the I mean, there's no way that many people would have torn it apart so fast if they were still resisting the idea that their government would do that to them. I have to tell you, I've been following these shootings since, well, seriously since 2007, but really it goes back a lot further because... I was personally pretty impacted by the assassinations that happened when I was a kid. I don't remember a lot about the JFK assassination. I remember seeing the newspaper headlines when Robert Kennedy was shot. And I remember the response in this country when Martin Luther King was taken out. I remember the Texas Watchtower shootings and many of the mass shootings and even the assassinations that have taken place over the last 40 years. But... In 2007, the Virginia Tech shooting caught my attention because it became very obvious that if you looked at it, there were patterns to this. Yes. And looking at it now and having done the kind of inquiries that I've done into MK Ultra and into general mind control, I've realized more and more that you can begin to capture patterns on all kinds of different levels. The Batman massacre shooting in Aurora was just off the charts in terms of how many clues are on the floor, how many symbolic, I call them iconic things occurred. When we then triangulate that into Sandy Hook, and we've talked about this a little bit before, the Sandy Hook thing got really creepy as people began to dissect the then-just-released DVD and Blu-rays of the Batman movie, and all of a sudden, they're isolating frames where there's a map inside the movie pointing to Aurora and to Sandy Hook. Now, I have my own theories about what that is, and it's far more complex 
than simply film designers who may have clandestinely planned these images. But I'm wondering what your take is on that in terms of how these things are now flowing through each other and also the level of desperation they must have to be able to stage these kind of events. Well, that is the pattern, is that there is a direction they want the populace to go, and they want the populace to believe that they have arrived at that destination and conclusion based on their own free will. And this is where the manipulation comes in. The intent was for people to go, oh, yes, yes, please give up our guns to save the children. And that's where this came in, was to emotionally manipulate people into going along with that. But it doesn't matter if we're talking about this or anything else. Like this story that I just mentioned about the boss of Google talking about mm -hmm. the need for IDs because your virtual reality profile is going to be hacked. He is preceding the collective with the idea that it's going to happen. And I can guarantee you that when it starts happening all over the place, it's them doing it. And they're going to make life miserable for people so that people will say, oh, yes, yes, please make sure we all have an ID, which is just a really nice way of saying a microchip. <laughs> you know, it may not be a real microchip, but at some point it will get to that. It's incrementalism. And we know that. So the other thing about it, too, Randy, is that I did a show with Mel in 2011, uh, Mel Fabregas of Veritas, where I talked mm -hmm. about these actors. And that's what these actors are used for. And at the time, you know, even he was somewhat hesitant to really discuss it. But it's obvious now. You see, that is a huge... Uh-oh. I lost you. Obvious. Okay. We're having an internet connection problem on Skype. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I Nothing cut out for me. Can you hear me now? Yeah, no, you just dropped out for a second. But this little flag came up on my Skype. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, basically, these people are actors. And the people that were used at Sandy Hook, you can find the comp In fact, there was a drill, and that's the other part of the pattern. Every time we have yes, something exactly. like this happen... There's a drill going a on. A DHS drill. A DHS drill. People are paid for it. And this particular group of actors comes from a company called Crisis Actors. Yes. And one of the things that they specialize in is shootings. So this is not a coincidence. People have to understand that they're being manipulated by all of these things to get them to move into a direction that they're being told is for their protection when, in fact, the people who brought the problem to them did it for the sole purpose of having people react that way. Well, I don't know if you recall that article that I posted the week of the shootings. I actually was able to go into Crisis Actors um, database at that point in time and actually located a photo that I believe was the woman who was posing as the school teacher that was interviewed on ABC News. And within a number of days, that website was passworded and locked down. You can no longer go online and look at Crisis Actors database. They're what are called their headshots. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah, they locked it down. Because I was following Twitter and uh, I got a Twitter from somebody that said Crisis Actors is now locked down, and I went over and looked at it, and I went, well, that's pretty interesting. Because as far as I know, I don't believe anybody else has done that, and I'm not taking credit for it. I think I was supposed to see that. And I've asked other people who do this kind of work, and they said, it could be a coincidence, but mm, the more you look at the photographs, it's not likely a coincidence. The interesting thing about it is that that school teacher would have been planted there at some point previously. In other words, and I have evidence that that's the case because I have a photograph of her, it's not a good one, that was taken last summer of 2012. So there's a lot of threads to this that go into a classic PSYOP because understand something, war is waged by putting assets into place ahead of the actual conflict. We know that there are pre-planted assets in almost any war. That includes the uh, Iraq wars, Afghanistan. You will see the deployment of critical cargo weeks before declared conflict. So we have to assume that they staged this rather well and that they would have also put into place their assets, which would have been people like crisis actors, and infiltrated them into that community. 
That's true. And, you know, again, if people can understand the manipulation patterns, because first of all, the moon landing was faked. Yeah. So it's not the first time they've done this. The Jessica Lynch story, Jerry Bruckheimer was involved in that. He's the producer of all the CSI movies and some other shows. The woman who testified in front of Congress is saying that Saddam Hussein was taking the babies out of the, the ward that they were in and placing them on the cold floor to die. She was an actor. Yeah. And so you see, people really need to get to a place where they understand that these actors are trotted out in front of the camera to tell a story that the, the, the people trying to manipulate us already know how we will react to based on the fact that we do love human beings and we do want to protect human beings. But they are predefining to us through these stories who we need to be protected from. And it's not the people we're being told we need to be protected from. It's from the people actually manipulating us, which are the people <coughs> that are using the actors. People sent me to a website called wellaware1.com, and Gabriella right. Giffords was a very interesting case because he actually had footage of her under a different name making almost the exact same speech, using the exact same hand movements, wearing the same earrings, but it was a different woman under a different name. And he found out, looking for her congressional records, that she doesn't have any. So she may not even be who she says she is. She may herself be an actor. She may not even know that she's an actor. And another really interesting thing about that, which I'm glad you brought it up because I wanted to mention it, there was another shooting today in Arizona. And how coincidental yeah. is it that she was testifying on banning guns today when that happened in Arizona? And the other interesting thing about this is that they understand the human mind well enough to insert different words and phrases that they know have a psychological meaning to the reader or the listener. And what I found really interesting about this story is that the police officer that they were interviewing Guess what his last name was? Oh, no. Holmes. Say that again? Holmes. H-O-L-N-E-S. Oh, wow. Now, I i don't know if people are really familiar with this kind of thing, but just as an example, there's a, a show I really liked called White Collar, and the main character was a major con artist and thief, and uh, in this one particular episode, he was having this FBI agent walk in with three different diamonds, one was pink and one was blue and one was white. And they really wanted her to, this woman that they were presenting them to, to pick the pink diamond. So he taught this man how to get her to do it with subtle psychological clues. And he said, wear a pink tie and keep stroking it while you're talking to her. And keep using words that rhyme with pink. So he said, you know, I really think we should go out for a drink. <laughs> and, you know, so the moment that I saw that this police officer's last name was Holmes, I thought, this can't be a coincidence, because who are people going to associate that with? One of the things that I uncovered in investigating crisis actors was that this was um, basically set up and subsidized under the uh, Colorado Safety Task Force by a state senator named Steve King. So I drilled down into Steve King's information. He's now a state senator. He was a congressman at the time. Stephen King is a former police detective, and he's also the founder of a company called American National Protective Services. They're located in Capitol Heights, Maryland, which is a bedroom community of Washington, D.C. And, oh, guess what they specialize in? Emergency Operations Command and Control to Government Agencies. Yes, and I tell you, every time people research this stuff, that's exactly where it goes. And I don't know, you know, especially where the gun control goes, because that's what all of this type of manipulation is for. That's why these things are happening. That there is a company that's buying up the companies that manufacture bullets, and they're buying massive quantities, which is making the availability harder yeah. for the yeah. for the yeah. And people found that the company who's buying this, when they went back through who owns that company and who owns that company, it goes back to George Soros. Which we've seen the same thing with Dick Cheney and Boots and Coots. When the oil spill happened, you know, he bought that company right before and they specialize in oil cleanup. I mean, it's the same thing over and over. Really, this pattern repeats a pattern. When I saw the Steve King information, it repeated a pattern I saw way back in 2005 to 2007 when I was investigating Eric Prince and Blackwater. 
which later became Z. But Blackwater became the largest for-profit private army in the world. They're still active in Afghanistan. They're all over the world. They were recruiting military assets from Africa and other places where there was an excess of commandos, basically to go in and operate parallel to our own military. But the trick was that Blackwater guys were getting paid $50,000 to $75,000 a year. Our USGIs get nowhere near that kind of compensation. So then you have the fascist overtone as well. You have this idea, like this Mr. King, that you can run parallel operations and use all of your contacts to set up lucrative business operations while at the same time spoofing the American public. It's just, it never ends. And once you see that pattern, now you have a skeletal outline and a way to look at things like Sandy Hook. So people like you and I and other people out there who are seasoned veterans now have a template that each time one of these events occurs, we can lay it down and we can begin to put pieces together on a whole bunch of different levels. You know, that is exactly right, and that is the key to it, which is why it's so important for me to teach people the patterns, because it's very much like that saying, once the audience knows how the magician performs their trick, they don't see the illusion anymore. All they see is the trick. And if we can get people to understand it's the same pattern over and over and over again, once they learn it, they're going to see and understand and know immediately when it's being used, and they won't fall for it anymore. And that's really essential because... These things are done to manipulate us, not just in ways to get us to react a certain way, but also to get us to not react at all to something that's more important that deserves our attention. And really, you know, Crystal, that was the point behind you writing these two books. I know you went through a pretty deep personal journey, certainly leading up to the writing of your first book. And, you know, tell people a little bit about the books. I know the first book right now is currently out of print, but you might want to go into a little bit of that so they know where to look for the information. Well, the first book was based on my understanding that we are repeating and duplicating the exact same patterns that led to the previous extinction episodes. And that if we can't understand those patterns and where they're coming from and therefore change them, we will get where we're going. That's what that book was about, and, and it was a study guide. It's a fiction book that provides people with the resources they need to see that this is not something that I've imagined. The science is there. The papers are there. I had patents for chemtrails and HARP included. People really need to get this because they're being so duped. And the second book was fiction, and I really enjoyed writing it so much more because I could build so much more into it in terms of projections. Because the first stage a person goes through is, do they have enough information to even connect the dots? And where a lot of people will stop is, okay, I've connected all these dots. And what they do not do is project the continuation of that pattern to its conclusion. And that's what has to happen, or people are not going to understand where this goes. And it goes to our own end if we don't change it. And the second book is really two different books in one. One is the kind of future that I really think we need to really strive for, and the other one is a future that we will end up with if we survive that long. And I really don't like the fact that the future we have now is so much more like the darker future that I wrote about in that book. And a really good indicator of this is what I was just reading to you, because in that book, the environment had been so destroyed that people actually had to move into, today we call them FEMA camps, but in the book they were much, much larger and they were called relocation centers. And people could not grow food on the outside because of the destruction of our atmosphere and the over-radiation of plants. So they were forced to move into these places to survive. And one of the characters that's in that book, it was really easy for them to label her a terrorist because she wasn't using the credit system. She was using cash. Mm. And that's coming. They are going to tell people, you're going to get an ID or a chip or whatever it is if you have nothing to hide, and you'll start using a cashless system if you don't have anything to hide. That's not what this is about. This is about making sure they can cut people off and that people cannot survive outside of that system when they are cut off. 
Well, it's all been preceded because we've had credit cards for um, almost 60 years, probably in some form. But for most people, the 1980s ushered in two things. Wider availability of commercial credit cards to the general public. Before that, that was sort of the purview of the wealthy. And the use of what at that time were called ATM cards which later became debit cards, which then melded into the debit cards we see today, which are, you know, branded Visa and MasterCard type credit cards. But the advertising that has gone into this Visa, it's everywhere you want to be. The cost of whatever, priceless, as long as you can whip out the plastic card. The idea that we would use cash, you watch TV, watch media, you're not going to see cash transactions much. There's commercial out there where this guy goes up to the counter to buy his fast food takeout and he pays with cash and everything comes crashing to a halt. Like, oh, he paid with cash. That's going to, why would it be faster to pull cash out of your pocket than use a credit card and transact that? You ever get stalled in line doing a credit card transaction? I do it all the time. But the mind control in this is that cash is now an artifact of a distant past and we're being groomed to accept only electronic digital transfers of assets. Yes, but what people have to understand is why are we being groomed for it? And that was a really good example about the fast food thing because you've already seen the death panels are coming out. Obama's going after smokers and there's an, another type of person that Obama's we're going after. Obama's a smoker. That's <laughs> I know. And uh, you know the mayor of New York is banned soda. But here's what's going to happen, is once all of your movement is electronically tracked, guess how your insurance company is going to use your buying habits against you? Yeah. And here's what's going to happen on top of that. People are going to be too poor to eat any other thing but junk, and then they're going to hold it against you because you are. So how do you deal with that? You know, people say, yes, well, grow your own food. Hey, I am all for that, and I do my share of that. I'm going to do more of it. But you see, that's the only out people will have, and that's why they're being targeted. Raw milk farmers are being targeted. People trying to grow their own organic food on their property are being targeted. People are having their property taken away from them, which is part of Agenda 21, is the loss of property ownership. So people really have to get a good grasp of how this is all connected, and it is about making sure that every single thing that you do is monitored and then can later be used to oppress you further and what Orwell said, imagine a boot on your face forever. When there is nowhere for you to hide, they will have exactly what they need to make that your reality. And if everything is electronic and you can't use cash, there will be nowhere for you to hide. So the elites have their plan. They're working their plan. They have the means to mobilize their plan. They've owned the minds and hearts of the majority of mainstream Americans. And it's not just America either. It's global. But since the advent of television, they've pretty much owned our eyeballs. Hence, they've been able to own our minds. What is our move? What do we do to counter something that looks so overwhelming? Well, the only way that I personally know how to deal with this is to take whatever opportunity I get through gracious people like yourself who will entertain me and my message, which is, this is a pattern we cannot survive. It is not intended for us to survive by those who bring it to us and who manifest it, and none of our ancestors have ever survived it. And that's the bottom line. And from there, we can all begin to work from that place, because that's the thing. People say, well, you know, how do we deal with it? Well, what is the it? I don't have a prescription for people as individuals and what they should do as an individual to contribute to the change. But I do feel like it's important for them to understand that without change, you know, previous generations, their concern was what kind of a future are we going to have? But we are at a place where we don't even know if we're going to have one. And that's very different. You know, I don't care who they are. I don't care if it's the 1% or the 99% or a Christian or a Muslim or an atheist. Everybody wants a future. And the only way we're going to get it is together. In a lot of ways right now, as fragmented as it is and as controlled as it is, I see these glimmers of hope in the social media, in some of the work that's being done by independent journalists and bloggers, 
And I'm also that there are, we'll call them, gosh, I hate this term so much, we'll call them white hats for now, people inside who possibly do have the best interests of the people at heart. Can we expect to see this increase in consciousness that we've been going through, which I believe you pointed out and I agree with, sort of arced on December 21st? Is that enough? Is it enough to propel us? Are they winning or are they kind of in a holding pattern right now? Well, at the moment... I think that in a sense we are winning, which is why we are in a holding pattern and not going backwards. We are not going forwards, but that is victory in its own right, <laughs> because we're not going backwards either, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's important. And courage and hope are also important. And there was a video that I found, it's about 20 minutes, I put it on my Facebook page, about the man, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize for his work with trying to save the children in China who were, you know, put out to slaughter because of their one-child policy. Yeah. And he said that the Obama administration at the moment is trying to clean house by asking people whether or not they will fire on American citizens. And if people say they won't, they are discharged or they resign. But at the same time, this fellow said two very, very important things. First of all, there are people who are going to stay in and behave as though they will, and when the time comes, they won't which I think is important. That means so much more than somebody resigning. If you know how the game is being played, you can play it. That's important. And there are people that are going to stay in and play it. But he also said that the way people have reacted to their attempt to take our guns has shocked them because they thought we had had enough fluoride in our system or sleeping long enough that we would just go with it, and we haven't. So they're having to regroup and figure out how to handle it. And in the meantime, guns and ammo are flying off the shelves. Yeah, so there's glimmers of hope out there. And, you know, the next hour, James is coming on, and who knows where that's going to go. But my thoughts on this are, yes, we're having these conversations, and yes, apparently the energies are beginning to line up with us. And part of what we have to do now is be true to the compass that I think is being repointed our intentions, our thoughts, our actions on a very concrete level, if we line up with that energy, I don't know if we're unstoppable or not. I shudder to think that we are about to enter the extinction cycle as we did, you know, those six times before. I'd like to encourage people out there, you know, as stop being partakers of truth. Stop being partisans. Stop being schismatic. I went on to Facebook yesterday, a group of people who are actually personal friends of mine, people that I know in real life, and they were going on and on and on about the gun control thing, and it was all polarized Republican and Democrat. And I posted some information, I posted an interview that I had done, and I said, stop fighting among yourselves as partisans. That's the game that they want you to play. And we're being undermined within our own groups right now. We've had insurgents that have come in and played very divisive games within the alternative community. We have paid agents who are within the alternative community as well, and we have to smoke them out and get rid of them. And we also have to be very pure-hearted about our intentions. Can you kind of like just jump off of anything I said there that resonates with you? Sure, I mean... Or doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's all connected, and not in some airy-fairy unicorns and glitter way, but in a very real way. Yes, the gun control issue is important because of where these people are coming from. It is a historical fact that these types of people disarm their population before a genocide. That is a fact. But people also have to understand that this is so much bigger than just guns, because these people are killing nature to kill us. That's what all the massive fish die-offs are for. That's what all the bizarre weather is for. It's killing food crops. Because they're trying so hard to sell the overpopulation and it's too much carbon in the air myth because the means to correct that, if people don't understand the true problem, is more control over our lives and depopulation. 
That is a lie. That is not the problem. These problems are being caused by these people in the hopes that we will be too stupid to recognize it and go, oh, yes, take more of my rights. That's the way to do it. That's not the answer. These people have to be removed from the equation. Now, we have a justice system that is designed to do that, but that has also been corrupted. And something I really loved about Ron Paul was he very specifically answered the question that he was asked, well, how do people on the outside fix what's happening on the inside? And he said, it's simple. You turn the inside out. You become the inside. The people from the outside go into the inside, which is why people have to take action. And they need the proper knowledge to do it because it's very much like that Latter-day Saints commercial they used to play all the time. When it comes to being a good Samaritan, it's not just the thought that counts. And that's the truth. People have to stop depending on somebody else. Somebody else is going to fix it. Or giving in to the New Age babble that tells them, oh, well, you know, this is just happening because Gia is trying to rebalance herself. No, they've even admitted they're betting on your weather and your crop failure yep, to the point that they're causing so many problems within the natural system that creates and regenerates life that they will cross a threshold where the system crashes. And they will not survive it either. Isn't that incredible, that yes. they're literally suicidal? Yes. And I would think they would know that because their predecessors didn't survive it any more than we did. It's not the first time. Yeah. And I think that's what's been lost in the whole thing, is the historical context. We don't know as a planet and as a race who we are, where we came from, and what our history is. And I think that's probably a great place to break this hour come back and talk about that and so many other things. James Horak will be on the line in a few minutes. We're going to take a break here, and then we'll come back with Crystal Clark and James C. Horak. In a lot of ways right now, we are the resistance. What we're up against, what we're dealing with, in a sense, it is a battle with ourselves. It is a battle of knowledge. It's a battle of will. It's a battle of souls, and it's a battle of spirit. And I don't think there's two better people to encapsulate all that and really put the proper, I hate to say spin, uh, gravity to it than uh, my two guests. And uh, back for the second hour is Crystal Clark, and we welcome to the show James C. Horak. James, welcome back to uh, Off Planet Radio. Thank you, Randy. I enjoy it. It's good to hear your voice again, my friend. And Crystal... Welcome back to you, too. James, Crystal, we have a big base of material to cover. And Crystal and I talked about this uh, on the break. The only way we can deal with the amount of substance that there is to be put out there is to break it down into digestible nuggets. And Crystal did this with her most recent blog post in good order, I think. The article, by the way, is Cosmology and Perpetuated Ignorance, What We Were Never Told and Why. <laughs> Where do you even begin with that? Well, like I said, now that people can really grasp how far the government will go to keep them ignorant, this article, I felt comfortable releasing it, and this is the truth. But these people have hidden how many planets are in our own solar system. Yeah, from us. this was something and we talked about in private. And I've been more and more stunned by this as I came to an awareness of that fact of how the galaxy works, what the shift's really about. So go into that. Let's enlarge that. Well, this again is a pattern we have seen before. It replicates itself everywhere until we do something about it. The idea that people would hide from their planet, the people on their planet, how many planets are in their own solar system is just as cruel and absurd as the Vatican hiding knowledge of our past. These people don't have the right, and they need to know that they don't have the right. And the other thing that was so important about releasing this information in this blog post is that people are continually being told that the powers that be are going to go hide while they do the rest of us in. And for a long time, the rumor behind that was that they can go hide on other planets. Even before I released this information, it should have been obvious to people that as 
much as they even publicly admit the disdain they have for the rest of us, if those people really had somewhere else to go while they did the rest of us in, they would have done it already. And they haven't. They clearly don't have the means to. And that's why I wanted to release the information about the fungus, especially, and the history, the playing cards, why the NASA missions were canceled. And also because, again, if people have proper knowledge, you can't snow them anymore. You can't emotionally manipulate them. And I think that's really critical. And I really do owe James a huge debt of gratitude for the information that he has provided. I think there are two reasons that I've really gravitated towards his work. The first one being that he also understands that we are at that point where we have a very limited window to turn things around before we get where we're going. And so he's often saying the same things. But the other reason that I think it's easier for me to understand, James, is that I have done many, many years of my own research where I found gaps and holes that I've been waiting or and looking for a way to fill, and he is the only person who's ever provided any information that does that and does it consistently across the board. So I don't know if you have any questions for James regarding that article. As I mentioned during the break, people asked him on his blog how many planets really are in our solar system. Okay, I'm intrigued to hear this myself because I have my own number, but I don't have any certainty to it. Go for it. James. You, you want me to tell you? Well, there are 13, counting Pluto. Of course, uh, they've passed a magic wand to determine that Pluto isn't a planet. It uh, orbits the sun, so it is a planet. But, uh, you know, they change their criteria, and so uh, getting us used to science as a edict rather than science as a, a determinant or any kind of proof or any kind of plausible and constructive theory. It's absurd, but we've had medicine, we've had physics and astrophysics all come under the province of a priesthood, and <laughs> it's just bizarre. <laughs> It has no relevance. Uh, up until the 30s, there was a faithful record of transient lunar phenomena, which was kept faithfully for over 250 years. And astronomers would see lights, or they would see movement. They would see tracks down in the craters in their uh, observatories and on the moon, and they would record them. And uh, in the recent history, all of that has become classified. And it was open to the public record before. But that's just a sampling of how all of a sudden you have privileged information and then you have the garbage sold to us for supposedly uh, science, supposedly medicine, supposedly what's going on in the world. And it, it's coming through a filter and it's strained of truth. I'm going to ask you the question that your detractors are, might ask, and that is, how did you arrive at that number, and how do you know that? Well, it's a matter that uh, I've been been around. And, uh, of course, I deal with people that uh, live on some of these planets mm -hmm. and moons. So uh, uh, we have neighbors we have intelligent neighbors, and we see them from time to time traversing our skies. Absolutely, and, yeah. And obviously craft that is not possible to earthbound technology, although they have started stooping in the last 20 years to try to say, oh, well, that's one of our flying triangles. Well, if you look at the witness reports of the Phoenix Lights, these were bigger than three football fields. They stacked together and then just poof. Does that sound like uh, earthbound technology? No. No, not at all. So, you know, I think that anybody today who is interested or fascinated in anything that pertains more than what you get on the 5 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and 10 o'clock news which, you know, is the uh, most boring thing you can listen to. <laughs> and anybody that is, is elevated themselves, I'm certain, above this uh, BS. And they're looking for, for answers to things that they know they're not getting from conventional sources. 
they're resorting to more and more the alternative media, and the alternative media has become infiltrated and turned and twisted and corrupted. And you have people that have fallen into traps that have been carefully laid to confuse and to stir confusion into almost every issue that is sensitive to the powers that be. And it's more evident in the alternative media than it is in the conventional because it's not discussed in the conven- in the mass media at all. I mean, they practice a mission. Well, they practice basically... Um Trying to think of the name of the committee now that met back in the 1950s that decided that anybody who even brought these subjects up would basically be ostracized. Oh, yeah. I think the first official stance actually came from NATO, the NATO alliance. And uh, there was a master sergeant who was sort of an attaché to some of the big wigs in the NATO meetings and uh, he came forward years ago and he said that the things that they discussed were just totally off the wall compared to what people were being told and that they blew uh, people that were uh, at the time trying to offer information on say Sidonia and the face on Mars and so forth which were very popular discussions at the time they blew those off the wall but the real problem is that if you look at ufology, it's always been not to get people to not believe that there are UFOs and not to believe that there aren't ETs, but to just keep that Pandora's box closed until they can characterize ET for us and use and opportunize in any way they want. And so it's a sensitive issue because uh, it's going to be very difficult for the people that have suppressed ET reality, UFO reality, to the point of killing and maiming and ruining careers. Uh, It's going to be very hard for them to do a turnaround and people not wondering why aren't they being charged with crimes. So they have their ways of doing it and Of course, that's going to become more apparent as time goes on. I hated to see a guy like Gordon Duff being used in a way to bring forth that hostile alien presence uh, back last year when they discussed this Chinese fleet off our Pacific coast that was protecting us from a hostile alien base under sea. (laughs) And that was really funny. That was the event off of Catalina Island in California, is that correct? I don't remember them ever specifying it. I gathered that it was in deeper water. Okay. But they used Duff. And he is a very sincere gentleman, and he represents veterans very nobly. He is one of the editors of a veteran's website and publication. And he's come up with a lot of issues. He's been forthcoming with a, a number of things that the establishment much rather keep under wraps Concerning the welfare of veterans, he gets this stuff from the source. And, of course, this is one of the ways that they dispense their misinformation, disinformation, and what I call malinformation. In this case, it's malinformation because it leads to a project that is fictitious, like a false flag. And, of course, had that taken, had there not been enough people standing up and saying, this just doesn't make any sense, who knows what they would have moved on to. But I, I don't think they're going to sell a hostile alien thesis now. And uh, I think that's pretty dead in the water because it's just not washing. And so they're going to move on to something else. And I have had a feeling for some time now that the implementers for the Monsters New World Order have their own agenda secretly that the elite don't even know anything about. They're going to find that, you know, if they... They try to implement the final stage in the New World Order. They're going to find themselves buried underground in a death trap. And I wanted to ask you about that, James. First off, I want to back up a little bit. What happened, we'll say 1947 forward, the modern era of ufology, from Roswell through the flaps that we had in the 1950s and the 1960s into the era when we began to hear the stories about alien abduction 
and forward to the day because the UFO community is completely schizophrenic. Um, yes. We have two sides. We have the goo-goo-eyed New Agers who believe that the Galactic Council of Light is here to redeem us, to give us money, to um, imprison all of the cabal. And then we have the malevolent ET scenario, which is the abduction scenario on steroids, which says that we are imminently poised to a takeover by an alien society. So what happened in that time frame? How did we get so schizophrenic? And what is the source of the misinformation? And what is the message that we need to deliver to people who are hearing what I will call a dichotomous message? Any time that uh, there has been any movement, whether it was in religion or whether it was in ufology or whether it was in cults, the CIA has been Johnny on the spot to find some way in which they can use it. And Jonestown was a good example. Heaven's Gate was a good example. Yeah. You can go on and on. Way you can good. name yeah. these things. But the fascination with E.T. became very profound in the late 70s, early 80s. And this intergalactic brotherhood or intergalactic federation of light, it started out as an intergalactic federation. It was started here in Texas. I've met some of the people that started it. One of them invented the lockdown valve for oil wells. And it's very important. And it would have saved a lot of oil from getting into the Gulf of Mexico back when Pimlico, which is the only oil company in Mexico, and one of the biggest stockholders is the Bush family. If they had had that lockdown valve in that uh, particular well that ended up putting millions of gallons of oil, of crude oil, into the Gulf of Mexico a day. And that went on for some time, and of course it was downplayed by the horror media. hope I can say that. Absolutely. Uh, you can cuss. Yeah, okay. I met these people through another party, rather infamous individual that I'd known for some time. And we went out on a shooting spree in Big Bend National Park and had a ball. And I met them, and they were all joking about how they had started that and put it over. I think they were very open with me because I already had some knowledge about them. They had first advertised themselves in a little publication that came out of a postal service station back when I was a carrier. A guy came in, and he had this little publication, and he told fortunes, and he advertised through people that sold talisman and so forth. It was sort of semi-cult or occult publication, and that's what they chose to advertise. Their first advertising was in it, so I knew all about that. And so they opened up and just laughed, and they joked about it. They thought it was so cool. But they were about eight of us all together, and uh, six of them were connected with the oil industry one way or the other. And, and the guy that had invented the lockdown valve was very well off. So they did it on a lark. They did. <laughs> the whole thing was a lark. And, of course, if you pay a lot of attention, you get to a point where you see where that came over into this other little trend called light working. Mm-hmm. That whole thing is such an admixture. The best part of it is metaphysics. The worst part of it is just blatant, I would say, superstition, woo-woo, whatever you want to call it. I've even seen some of these people that have these light-working churches. Yeah. They profess they're Christian, they profess this and they profess that, and then they're following theosophy to the T. And they take and borrow from other people's work and build uh, constructs and then they change them and alter them to suit whatever's popular at the time. They're all con artists. The one that my last wife got into was criminal. They were into criminal activities and got her involved in criminal activities. So the new age leaves me cold. I don't see integrity, I don't see penetration, I don't see respect for personal responsibility, and I damn sure don't see any truth. Well, you made the distinction between metaphysics, which is a discipline, 
Yes. And I think yes. the three of us on this call tonight would agree that spirituality was marginalized mainly by the Christian and the Islamic cultures because these religions basically forged doctrine out of books that were altered. So a lot of people were left with a gutted religious system, which Crystal points out in her book as well. And Crystal, I want your feedback on this too. The metaphysics side of it is the spiritual aspect that I think is inherent in each one of us that has been cut off by a religious system. And when we talk about New Age, that's a big ball of wax. Separating out the aspects of it that are genuine is very difficult for a lot of people. And a lot of people run screaming from it simply because they're told by Islam or by Christianity that they will go to hell for practicing certain things, such as use of crystals or using energy healing, things like that. So maybe where we begin this is to unravel the ball, wax a little bit from the spiritual side, and justify a structure where we can orient a little bit. Well, what really strikes me is how you can have a religion based on a handful of people that believe and then con their followers into believing that they speak for God when in fact they will not and cannot tell you how this is all created. Even saying that sounds woo-woo, but I'm telling you, it's a very real science, and this is beyond the circle of life in terms of the birds and the bees. And Creation is a very real science. When we don't know how it works, we get duped into participating in our own demise. And this is what really bothers me, is that maybe we will never actually see the actual face of God. Maybe there isn't one. I don't know. But to watch entire generations fill rivers of blood over fighting over who God really is, rather than can we just understand creation enough to the point that we don't mess it up to our own demise? Why isn't that more important? Why don't they focus on that? And a very telling thing for me in my own research was, and I've talked about this many times, creation is very much like a computer code, a virtual reality program. And if you start injecting viruses, which we literally do to our children, by the way, <laughs> it goes in and it rewrites the code and it doesn't function anymore. And then we have the chimera thing, which is GMOs. And what is the devil? Is it not a chimera? It's a mishmash of all this stuff into a creature that doesn't really have a function anymore. And that they can't grasp that very simple analogy is really on some levels disturbing to the point of being mind-blowing, that they don't get it. James? I don't think people appreciate the gift of free will. I think that they have been conned into a role of a dreamer. I think that the reality they accept is what is imposed on them. Their opinions are formed. Their attitudes are all limited by what they know and what they have researched to make their own knowledge base. So few, so little of that exists, and so few people take advantage of actually doing any research, doing investigation, that you've got, I would say, a large percentage of people that as long as their quality of life is at a certain point, they're not going to be disturbed. They're not going to allow themselves to be disturbed. Then you have another percentage of people that can see things are trending downward and want to know why. And then you have people that have already determined why and are trying to do something about it. Now, in this group, let's say, there's none of the 1%. There's none of the social engineers that work for the 1%. And there's none of the military henchmen that will do their evil bidding. So that leaves about 95% of the population that falls in one of those three categories. Now, you want to get more people from the middle. You want to get them aware and functioning in their own self-interest. And the others, it's going to take going hungry for about three days. Mm -hmm. And when they wake up, they'll say, you know, there's no reason for this. And there isn't any good reason for that. But there are reasons that it is happening. And once they start looking and they see this isn't going to go away, and then they begin thinking back about what their friends tried to tell them all along, hey, this is coming. This is intended. 
And this is why. They got that far with them, and they're going to start saying, damn it, they were right. <laughs> and then they're going to say, I want a gun and some ammo. That's the next thing they're going to say, because even if you stored food, you're not going to be able to keep your food if you don't have a way of protecting it. These monsters have hard times destined for us. In their own mind, they look on this. See, they're like Marie Antoinette. Well, people are hungry. Well, feed them cake. There's no bread. Well, feed them cake. You know, that's the kind of out of our reality they are. So when this starts coming down, the people that are waking up because they're hungry, because there's no food for them to buy and nothing to buy it with because hyperinflation is cut so deeply into their purse, they're going to start saying, well, you know, what's the reason for this? Hey, there's no good reason for this. My buddy tried to warn me about this, and if I'd listened, I'd have some food. I'd have a way of protecting my food, Kachi, and I wouldn't be in this mess. And so they're going to be... They're going to have pregnant thought, maybe for the first time in their life. But they have lived on hope that the economy will recover. Well, if they had any economic background, if they had the knowledge to have any economic background, they know there's no reason for that hope. NAFTA and GATT have to be thrown out the window. The industry has to be brought back, our national patents protected. All these things that have been traded away so politicians could line their money with Chinese favors and with the corruption that has turned people that are policymakers away from national sovereignty and into international crime. I would like to interject because, you know, one of my biggest goals and sometimes challenges is to prevent needless suffering. And whether it's a naive view or not, I don't know. But I really am convinced that if we can show people the way they're being manipulated through that showing and telling, we can prevent more people willingly participating in their own demise simply because they don't know any better. And when it comes to crimes against humanity, one of the envelopes that I pushed in that cosmology article was to get people to see, because this confuses people on purpose, how do we reconcile what an abductee goes through versus the idea that there is not now, nor will there ever be a hostile ET invasion? And James has answered this over and over again in his own way, but people are constantly manipulated into looking at something else that does not serve them, and they have not connected the dots, but they need to, and it's time. I want people to understand that what is happening when people are abducted is coming from our own government. It is not coming from anywhere else. James has tried to explain this in terms of what the EVs are, who created them, and why we have latched onto them here in our own system. And furthermore, and the three of us have talked about this privately because we don't want to hurt people, but at the same time, as I've said, there can be no peace without the truth, no matter how ugly it may be at the time. People who are talking about or sublimating their abduction experience into the idea, well, maybe some good came out of it because I have a hybrid child. I want people to understand that is a lie. There are no hybrid children. It's not possible. You cannot reproduce a child between a human and a gray. That is not what's happening. And this is why I went out of my way to make sure that in that article I talked about the Nazi experiments in eugenics being done a decade before that supposed meeting with Eisenhower because people have been wrongfully taught to believe that it's not possible for a human being to be that sick. But how fast did they forget about what the Nazis were doing? They made lampshades out of human skin. That's how sick human beings are. The human beings that we call the shadow government are. And when the EBs came along, Oh, look, another tool for our toolbox. And imagine the power that gave them to remove a person from their home in the middle of the night anywhere on the planet and take genetic samples. There are no hybrid children. That is not true. EBs are a government tool in their toolbox, and they're using it against humanity 
the destruction of our natural systems so that they can later say, oh, look, now there really isn't enough for everyone, is not how far they've went. That's not the entirety of it. We talked about this in private, Crystal. James and I have talked about it, too. And one of the reasons why I originally did this show and why I interviewed abductees was to try and get as close to the truth as possible. My research took me in places I didn't expect to go. And one of those areas was into the realm of MK Ultra and mind control. And these are subjects that I've researched for decades. And the statement you just made may go over the heads of people who listen casually, but if you have to rewind it and listen to it, because we're dealing now with hard truth, because there are people out there, and I know some of them, that believe their experiences. I know because I've interviewed them. I have a pretty good intuitive sense of the difference between a liar and, and somebody who believes what they're honestly saying. The fact of the matter is that what has happened did happen, just not under the circumstances they've been presented. And the tell for me on this was the consistent presence of military, white-coated lab technicians, and seemingly underground bases, and a distinct lack of the ability to describe craft or traveling anywhere outside of the realm of Earth. Those are all data points, again, using the researcher technique that I've had to use as I threaded through this. And so this is not to discredit anybody's experience. It's to say that we're dealing with something far darker. It is very easy to embrace the idea of an alien enemy because they're not like us. It's romantic to conceive of the idea that you have contributed to a star child but those two romantic polarities or those horrible polarities however you view them if their deception are not truth and we have to deal with that and there may be some who differ with this call tonight and I understand that but I believe that what Crystal just said was epic in terms of what we have to grasp in terms of the distortions that have gone on in the alternative research community. Well, just really quick, James, I, I want to point this out. We know that before they admit public anything publicly in terms of technology... Sorry, Crystal drops out occasionally. <laughs> I posted an article about how hacking the human brain is the next endeavor in the war model, and also how an experiment was done where electrically exciting a certain portion of the human brain in a person who was awake and looking at someone they knew changed the face of the person they were looking at and they thought they were looking at someone else. These technologies have to be understood for the damage they can cause based on the way they are being used and incorporated into that phenomenon to redirect people away from the real faces and the real culprits of who are really behind it so that we will never, ever clear it up because we won't know where to go to do it. We won't know who's responsible. Let me give you an example of how they can uh, alter reality. Years ago, I was on a forum where we discussed UFOs a lot, what people had seen and so forth. And uh, I had described a blonde UFO that I had uh, come across when I was coming into work early one morning. And uh, I pulled up under it, and I was looking up, and there were in the bottom there were these windows, and, and they were shaped like uh, a surgeon's theater. And these blondes were looking at me, and men and women, and you could tell that they weren't laying on their bellies because of the way their hair fell on their shoulders. So you could see by the perspective that the room in the UFO was much greater than its outside dimensions. Right, so right. I knew right away that what I was seeing, you know, quite a bit about what I was seeing because I'd been in one of these craft. Yeah, that's a good data point, too. Yeah, so I'm looking at it, and I'm describing the craft. Now, the EBs don't have anything like this. So uh, after I had uh, posted my account, a gentleman 
popped up and he said, could I call you on the phone? And I said, sure. So he called me on the phone from Salt Lake City. He was a Mormon elder. And he said, I seen exactly the same thing, only they were grays. And so I said, well, let me ask you a question. Could there have been an interruption between the time that you had this experience and the first account you gave of it? He says, yeah. I wondered about that. And I said, you saw blondes, but it was changed for you. And he says, you know, I have reason to believe, you know, there's something troubling me about that. And he came by, uh, he was going on the driving down to MUFON's headquarters in South Texas to get what he could find and see if they'd cooperate in giving uh, access to the archives, which they won't. And he came by and stayed with me overnight. And when he came back through, he spent the night with me and we talked. He was a very gracious man. I enjoyed his company, but that's an example of how people are interfered with that have these experiences. They can't mess with me because they can't hypnotize me. And I know what their technology is and how they employ it. So I pretty well see what's there. Other people have to look through psychic blocks. Even when I'm with somebody and there's something in the sky that is incredible, they don't see it until I describe it for them, and then they begin to see through this psychic block. The first blonde I ever saw, I was on Liberty. I told you about it in San Diego. And the people around me didn't notice that this girl was six foot nine and beautiful, blonde, looked like Anita Eckberg, who walked right by me. And I said, man, did you see that? See what? Look at her. They did not notice how remarkable, how, you know, it goes on all the time. I see it often enough. And there are people that if you start describing, if you start tapping that psychic block of theirs, they run and hide very quickly because subconsciously they see it. It's just not something that the right, conscious right. mind will Again, learn. a lot of observed phenomena or observable phenomena is not caught by the human eye. Because we're trained, this goes into observational techniques, we're trained to view things in a certain way. Our frontal eyesight is what, it, you know, some friends of mine call your lion eyes. And basically, we don't see things because we haven't been taught how to see from the wider perspective of our peripheral vision, which is a much more nuanced form of seeing. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, can you see the grid mat when your computer is booting up your operating system? Can you see the grid mat come up before the data starts coming up on your screen? Not front on, no. Well, you can learn to. Yeah. You can improve your reaction time tremendously. You just don't expect that you can, but you can. People in martial arts know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, I posted an article on this. I have a blog called Zenatera. It's posted on the website, and there's an article there that I went into some of this. There is something to that I would like to add if I, yes, ha if I have time. Yes, please. Yeah, sure. No, you My perspective on that is a little bit different, and it's because of an experience I had that I have talked about before. My husband and I are going on our 15-year anniversary, but we actually met when we were teenagers and then there was a 10-year gap before we got together again and got married. But during that time when we were teenagers, we were out late one night in a park, probably around 11.30, and, you know, doing what we did. We were making out. And this huge white fireball went right over our head, and it was so bright it lit up the sky. And I looked at him, and I said, did you see that? And he looked at me, and he said, what are you talking about? And because we're both really big jokers, I thought he was kidding. But he wasn't. He really did not see it, and it really blew my mind because it was so bright. Like I said, it was like this, it might as well have been a helicopter going overhead flashing a light on us. It was so bright. And what I learned from that experience is, and this is why I'm working so hard to talk about the phony reality matrix, is that your eyes are perfectly capable of seeing a great deal, but if your mind cannot perceive or does not have the precondition to understand that, your mind will edit it out, even though you saw it. Agreed. I agree with that, yeah. 
Oh yes. yeah, and, it's and that, uh, yeah. That's what a, that's what a lot of this perception yeah. management and this reality box is for is to keep your mind editing out what you really are seeing. The conscious act of training yourself to see things becomes the physical ability that overcomes that ability disability too. Um, that's what I meant about talk uh, training peripheral vision. We're just not aware that we have a wider scope of vision because we're trained to look straight ahead. As children. Yes, but yeah. even even if we see something in our peripheral vision right. that our mind doesn't believe we can see, our mind will edit it out. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And that's important. I mean, that's what this reality box is for, and that's what the propaganda is for, is to constantly make sure that the mind is in a position to edit out anything that goes beyond it. Well, there are a lot of people that believe if they haven't heard it discussed on television, in the news, or in, on a talk show or something, it doesn't exist. And uh, I've known a lot of people like that. And conversely, if they see it in a movie, a uh, science fiction or a fantasy or whatever, and you talk about the same thing that you saw that fit into that, they'll say, oh, no, that's in a movie. Couldn't be true. A lot of fictions designed to train us to think things that are true yeah. are fiction. That's right. That's yeah. right. And that's built in, and it's uh, taken advantage of, and the social engineers know it and use it. But still, I think that there are people in Hollywood making movies that are trying to give us clues. There are series that have come out that were very popular at the time that got into sensitive areas, and got canceled when they were very popular and even had already started working on episodes for the next season. Yeah, yeah. I have a couple of questions here, and I also, anybody that wants to call in, if you want to talk to James Hurak and Crystal Clark, so if you want to call in, we'll entertain your questions for a short period of time. Two questions came up. Question for James. Do you know of interterrestrials who reside on Earth and if so, will you share your insights on different interterrestrials is how the question is posed. Yes, I do. The blondes, of course. They Some live among us. I know one that you've probably seen. Then there are uh, people that come through. There are people that establish a presence here and use psychic blocks to keep their uniqueness from being fathomed. I've come across those. I knew one that had adopted a family for his cover, and he was extraordinary, and he could compress time. He's not around anymore, but when he was, I wish I'd got to know him better. In the past, there were people that came here to try to be of help. They ended up, in many times, being advisors to powerful people, kings, potentates, even various popes. Of course, when they do anything extraordinary, the primitive mind jumps on that, well, they must be angels. Uh, well, maybe in some definition or a, some viewpoint they're angels, but they're not angels uh, along the characteristic definition of one from the Bible. There have been people that have been out of time that have fallen out of interdimensional travel. They're, it's just on and on. The people that built the caverns in the Grand Canyon and left all kinds of technology there, they were people that survived a crash craft. There was a dynasty of pharaohs who were extraterrestrial. If you look at their mummies, the elongated head and the fact that they had a headdress to hide that, the Etruscans were inspired by a leadership that was extraterrestrial, and on and on and on. With current ET civilizations, I won't talk about them very much because I feel like uh, they should be able to discuss with you if the time comes. If you get over the hump, but you'll meet yeah. them, they'll tell you all about themselves. Yeah. Now, if it's a lost civilization, I'll tell you about them. Follow-up question. I get a caller here. Greetings, caller. Good evening, and welcome to Off Planet Radio. Hello. Hi. I have a question for James. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, my question is, you know, what's his opinion about the canyons? You know, you see, like, our government and everything like that is making these caverns and everything, you know, the underground caverns and underground places. What is his opinion on those kind of places, like the, you know, like their bug-out areas and all that that they're building? 
Well, if they try to use those as a refuge for themselves, they move to depopulate the earth. They'll never come out of them alive. So it's like an Egyptian tomb then? It'll be a tomb for them. It's not the first time it's happened either. Do you have another question? Any comments? Okay, anybody else want to call in at this point? We uh, will take a few more calls. Follow-up question from the Wolf Spirit chat room. It says, would James classify these blondes as the same as many call the Nordics? Yes, they're the same. Okay, so any other callers uh, out there? You've got a couple of minutes. We'll take your calls. So we've kind of uncorked a genie in a sense tonight. Because I think in the past, certainly with me, we've not gone in this area of basically debunking the alien abduction myth. And I've been real close to this for a long time because there's still a lot of unexplained phenomena out there that yes. I believe is being attributed to it. And I believe the open-minded investigators allow for that margin. We all have our prejudices. So how do we deal with people like, uh, I had Chris Hawley on a few weeks ago, and she's talked for a long time about real-time contactees and people who, um, I'll bring this caller in. Hello, caller. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. Uh, what's your name? Hi, my name's Kat. Hi, Kat. How are you? I'm really enjoying the show. Do you have a question, a comment, something you would like to uh, contribute this evening? Well... Something that I really wondered about for quite a few years is um, I've been, uh, my whole life has been rather strange, but I, I would like to know uh, how many people have screen memories of things that happened. Is this what they were just talking about, like the control, the technology of limiting your what you're really, really is in front of you? Because I get a lot of screen memories, and when I get those memories, I know what's up. I know something's happened. So I just kind of want to know like, if this happens to a lot of people. It happens to more people than you know, which is why yeah. we're talking about what we're talking about, because people do need to know. Because if it was a real memory, would you have a screen memory? So what's being hidden? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, because I, I get a lot of the physical marks, and uh, just I've had A to Z, but uh, I know that if I do get these... Uh, certain, I, I just call them dreams, but I know that, that I've been taken from Are they ever reflected in lucid dreams? All I can say is they're very vivid, and they're usually not very pleasant, and it may sound kind of strange, and I don't, I've never heard of anybody having this kind, but I get puppies, kittens, and uh, some stuff with horses, and when I have those kind of dreams... I call them dreams. I call everything dreams because there's so many things happening. Uh, I know that, and I w wake up with uh, puncture marks and bruises, and um, so I really, I've asked a lot of people about this, and I really don't get any answers, so I've just figured it's just a, a control thing. You may be being messed with. Oh, yeah, definitely. This has been my life. The reason that we're sharing what we're sharing, especially from my perspective, because it's so important to me to end suffering, is to stop yeah, those experiences. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of things uh, people are going through. Well, Kat, you've listened for a long time, and you're familiar with a lot of the research that we've done on the show. Isn't yeah. it interesting the parallels that run between alien abduction scenario and the experiences of people who have been part of covert government operations. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, we, we, we've been knitting that together for a long time here, and, and for me, unwittingly, I resisted it. I resisted it with James for a, a long time as well, because yep. there's a part of us that then has to deal with exactly what we talked about earlier. The threat is not from outside of us. It is people who are our own who are doing this yeah yeah you, and you know something tonight that was new to me that i'd never heard anybody say before was about there is no such thing as hybrids and uh hybrid children and that was a bit of a surprise for me because i've had 
experiences, uh, this is many years ago, like I'm kind of getting on in age here, but um, being pregnant and then not being pregnant, you know, and uh, not having a miscarriage or, or one that I remember type of thing, uh, two to three that I actually remember and who knows. So so what what's that all about? That well, part is very, very real and I would like for James to explain that. There are several things that could be going on. They can induce false pregnancy. I think that they uh, may promote a growth inside you, but EBs aren't doing e Not even EBs are doing this. This is covert black ops. Uh, it's, really uh, nice. They are taking tissue samples. They are genetically mapping you. I think that for every abductee, there is a file somewhere. Oh, uh, Yeah, and if pregnancy is a possibility it's not by an EB because they have no genetic number I speak of them ill because it's my bias but they are chunks of meat sewn together with a computer terminal yeah yeah that's Thank all you. they are and uh, you don't succeed into star travel get over the hump overcome your technology to go around yeah. jacking with people that are not there yet well, let me ask you this, and first, Kat, you know, yep. one of the questions that I've asked people that I've interviewed on the show who are abductees, and you can go back and listen to the Karina Sables interview, yeah, is funny. there a presence of military in any of this? Do you personally have a military connection or background, somebody in your close family that would have been connected? Um. Uh Possibly my my father. I remember when I was young, he used to have some. Um, he was in the army, and he. Um, how can I put this nicely? My whole family was very strange, and um, I remember when I was a kid, I was reading um, Project Blue Book stuff. I don't know where it came from. I remember what it looked like. I don't know where it went, but uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff like great chunks of my life are not there the other side of this is understand these are crimes of opportunity not yeah. only would there be military involvement you were in a public school system in all probability you also would possibly possess certain genetic markers that would have been noted at some point in time we think of genetic science as being new but based on the evidence that has been presented to me over the years Long before there was a human genome project, there was, in fact, a knowledge of genetic markers. Some of them are obvious. You know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed people would be just, you yeah. know, kind of the cartoon thing. Blood types, things like that, where you're targeted. People who demonstrate intelligence beyond the normal spectrum. These are people that were singled out and observed we talked about this repeatedly regarding Project Talent. And uh, if you heard my Duncan O'Finian interviews, you know the Project Talent yeah. was connected to MK Ultra. But what they don't tell you and what the lying Internet page for Project Talent doesn't tell you is that from the 1960s, they were recruiting people who fit certain profiles to be used as assets in covert military and intelligence operations, some of yeah. which involved psychic abilities, extraordinary abilities, intelligence, etc. Yeah. So, by process of elimination, we go through the details, and one by one we can begin to explain the alien abduction thing from another side, which is the important part. If you want to know the yeah. truth, you want to know the truth isn't this fantasy or this nightmare that it is something that now you can put your finger on and now we can begin to identify an enemy. And it's funny, you called in tonight because all three of us on this call tonight had this conversation. And it was kind of like, well, maybe it's time to take the gloves off and roll this thing out. And Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I think this is important stuff. It's why... You know, I wanted to extend the show, and I think um, we've all kind of met on the uh, battleground tonight and seen things maybe a little bit more clearly. Yeah, it feels good. Uh, I like the truth. I mean, I can't, I, anything other than that is, I have to know. And, um, you know, when Corrine and I are together, 
we we've had experienced this this last year. We you know uh, mm-hmm. missing time. I get marks, and we don't know what happened. I mean, we've had helicopters. Um, you noticed it on the same day. I th- I didn't realize they were circling. We live about a mile and a half from each other, about a mile. Right, right. And they were they were circling around her place and my place, going back and forth. And I didn't realize that, but she saw what they were doing. And so, yeah, and, and we go in a certain place just to go sit and be in nature. And there, there's um, helicopters coming up over the hill and disappearing. I think it was a drone. I'm not too sure about that, but it, it just sort of disappeared. Oh, just all kinds of stuff, you know. Uh, it gets a little tiring. Yeah. I'm sure for everybody, you yeah, know. It does. So uh, the more I can find out, and everybody can find out better. Well, the advance in genetics today, people don't quite understand that in the 50s, they knew that the XY chromosome in men contributed to a higher incidence of violence and criminal behavior. Mm-hmm. And they found that out because they were blood typing some of these men on death row. And they kept finding a higher incidence of this among death row inmates than among the regular prison population. And among the population on the outside, it was a great deal higher. Also, they knew that there were certain things that would change the contribution of sex, certain environmental things. In World War II, with deep sea divers that had to go down and repair ships, yeah. if they had to go down below 300 feet, for instance, or any length of time on a regular basis, they couldn't have boys. All their children were girls. So all of these things came out. What's interesting to me is this sort of thing is so little discussed. They want to leave genetic determination to their secrets, to their second science or the second technology, and leave it out of the equation because if you know about it, you might know what they're capable of. They don't want you to know about. Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah. Yes, you know, I would like to add to this that the removal of children with special gifts from the general population so that they can be used to the ends of the shadow government is something we are also repeating that was instrumental in causing cataclysmic episodes before. This is a pattern we are repeating. And the other thing about that is that so much of the contamination that we get from our food and our air and our water is trying to keep the new children from being born, although they do try to create them in their own laboratories as a method of control. Because if we all began to develop those abilities, we would overcome them quicker than they can appreciate. Well, there's a hell of a lot more of us than there are them, so... There is. Yes, you are so right. I'm sorry, but I just wanted to know, the people that are listening and you guys, um, when I was quite a bit younger, I remember a lot of like IQ tests and... Like I said, there's a yeah. huge blanks in yeah. my yeah. my life. I cannot account mm-hmm. for huge, and I do remember a lot of IQ tests and uh, psychological tests. And then I got kind of got to the point where I just said, "That's it. I'm not doing these anymore." And I, that's kind of what I, oh, I remember that. And um, what you just identified there is a marker. And yeah. I have more people who have told me these same stories off air than are willing to say so on air. They were culling people in that period of time. I don't know how long it went on, but I do know they were doing it because I know that I was tested and that testing had nothing to do with placement for school. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because, well, I'm 64, so I went, you know, there was a lot of weird stuff happening back then, and I know that just, just from being a kid and, and, and having certain, I call them memories and dreams and stuff. And I, I mean, I didn't have what you'd call an ordinary childhood. I know that because a lot of people, I, I tell this, I, I don't tell to anybody anymore because they, they get that deer in the, <laughs> deer in the headlight book. So I, that's when I just go, okay, you know, on to something else. And, um, oh yeah. Just, well, you just, and that was another point And, that's the cognitive dissonance within the general population. And Crystal and I talked about this as well. Some people's eyes just glaze over the minute you hit that subject because they can't oh, go hell there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
you know, and, and I, I also got what they called, um, uh, how come I can't remember it all of a sudden? That's another senior thing. <laughs> um, where they put you through school two years in one year. Yeah, yep. I did that twice, and I, you know, and I do remember, like, people with clipboards and people, I knew they were coming in to talk about me, and it was, it was like a classroom thing, uh, so I'm still putting all this stuff together. And. Well, if you ever want to contact me to talk about it, you know how to do that. Yeah. Um, I understand there's a lot of people. You've come on tonight and been pretty transparent about your experiences as you've done a few times making comments and things. So um, I think the more people talk about this, the more data points we get and the more we're able to ground this yep. argument in reality yes. and just find out no what hiding. it is for what yeah, it is. No hiding. It's got to be transparent. I can't tell you how grateful I am that you called in and that, and that you were so open to what we said. Yeah, well, I that means because, a lot. Yeah, I. <laughs> it's been such a creepy life. Anyway, I couldn't tell you anything you don't already know. Anyway, there probably you haven't experienced, but uh, pretty goofy some of it. But uh, uh, that's the way it is. You know, that's my life, and uh, I'm good with that. I have to know. You know, I'm one of those people. I have to know the truth, and I'm going to keep damn well big until I find out. We're going to find out. We are going, we to, are going to. We yeah, are we going are. to find out. Yeah. I promise you. <laughs> and, and oh, for sure. Do me a favor, Kat, and give my love to Karina as well. I, it's been yeah. like, too long since I yeah. talked to her, but you brought her name up tonight, and she's one of those witnesses, one of those people that came on this show and gave us a lot of data points. Yeah, yeah. I just saw her today. We went and uh, ate a nasty hamburger. <laughs> I don't eat meat very often, but oh, I'm suffering now. But, uh, oh, you give her a anyway, life. Yes. Yeah, I will do. I, I yeah, I, I will do that. I'll probably see you tomorrow. Excellent. Anyhow, guys, thanks for the show. I really enjoyed it. Thank you Thank so you. much for calling in, Kat. Good stuff. Oh, you're welcome. Good night. Anytime, Good like, night. Uh, lots of truth. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Kat. Good night. Yep. So along these lines, for people who did not read the article that I wrote on the cosmology tab, if James wouldn't mind explaining the fungus, if that may entice people to read the article because people are being constantly told that the powers that be can go hide on other planets and they cannot. And the reality of this fungus, and Norman Bergen having been the one who yeah. originally got the photos of it, which is something that if Carrie Cassidy of Project Camelot had not given him the shallow treatment during her interview of him, would have found out. And she would have been reporting it rather than us having to do it tonight. I want James to explain that fungus and why it's so important. I'm really suppressing my joy right now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I it, it, no, I it's understand. important. Yes, it is yeah. important. James, go ahead and, and explain well, that. Well, it was really interesting when he was describing to her the attempt on his life, and no follow-up question like, why would they want to kill you? And then he's describing uh, that they got into his bank safe deposit box. Did she ask, what did they take? No. <laughs> it's just one thing after another like that. But when uh, I was involved with people that were working with him and him for a while, I knew that he had a second book that he was working on that he's never finished, but in the course of it, he shared these images, and I saw them. They were a rover of a tripod with, uh, I guess, camera or lights, different equipment, American, that on Mars and on the moon, and covered with this fungus. There were timed exposures which showed how fast this fungus accelerated its growth. It, you know, it was obvious that it was feeding on the metal. So this was a humane way of getting the Soviets and the Americans off of the moon and off of Mars because they were starting to weaponize their bases. And they were told they'd have to leave. They didn't take that seriously. So it is a terraforming growth. And they released it. And so it was devouring, you know, they had enough time to clear out, which they did, but they haven't been back. You actually told that story on one of my shows one time as well, so that's been on the record before for anybody that wants to go back and check. Yeah. And I think it preceded the Bergrind interview. Interesting stuff. 
I think that Dr. Bergen was going to intend to put that in his book. I had made a kind of issue over it saying, you know, that's too spectacular right now when we're trying to promote the EMVs and get people to acknowledge them. And, you know, there wasn't too much at the time that to uh, indicate that they were going to be in the sun. Only one group had detected them in the sun after Hale-Bopp went through. So that was still something that was on the table, but not discussed. I was hoping that we'd get it discussed before we'd move on to the fungus. But he had the images. I don't know where he got them. It must have been uh, one of his former colleagues. But he had them, and I saw a number of them. I had them on my computer, and this computer was hit with a DOD virus. Oh, yeah. Knocked it out. Yeah, we've all experienced profound data losses in very mysterious ways as well. Hey, listen, guys, I want both of you to kind of wrap up where we've been tonight and where we want to go in the future because, as I said to Crystal, we have too much information to get out to people and do their own research, do their own thinking. So I want you guys to know that this is an open door, that we'll do these shows and... Whatever format or forum we have, we will try and get this information out. Very good. Yes, I really, really appreciate that, Randy, because my own experience so far has been, like I said, I thought the alternative community would be very interested to know that we're repeating all of the same mistakes that led to our previous cataclysm extinction level events. But, in fact, they weren't. They either want to talk about UFOs, which they don't have enough information to do properly, or they want to just believe they can pray and meditate it all away, and that's not going to work either. So it is, for me, a very rare find when I find a host that can genuinely understand the importance of the material and is not afraid of talking about it. So I really want to thank you for the time that you give us. It's time invested. I just consider it to be an investment. James, anything that you want to be heard saying going out tonight? Well, we have a chance that a new Hall of Records will yield a former lineage, a history about a former lineage, that right now there's a struggle to save for posterity or save for disclosure, and it's going on in Romania. So we'll see the outcome. It's a possibility something good may come of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I know what you're that. talking about. Yeah. 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 This is big stuff, folks, and we'll do this again. I want to thank my guests, Crystal Clark and James C. Hurak, for being here tonight. We're going to back out of here for tonight. This is All Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside you, and now's the time to really begin to dig it out. We'll be back next week. This is All Planet Radio.